spinning coasters, family coasters, and the world's steepest coaster. I'm Roller Coaster David, and this is Coasting Into Nickelodeon Universe. Nickelodeon Universe was the last park I visited on my recent trip to the USA. It opened for the first time just over a week ago, although I'd heard that the park wasn't really ready for the public, and probably shouldn't have opened yet. So today I'm visiting the newly opened Nickelodeon Universe Park on the outskirts of New York. The park just opened the other week, but unfortunately, as such, not all the rides are open yet. Things didn't start off too well, as when I arrived, I found the car park to be more like a construction site, and after walking through an eerily empty mall with not a single shop in it, I arrived at a nearly deserted park. When I got there, not one of the coasters was running, but after wandering around the park for a little while, fortunately some of them started testing, and eventually opened. The first coaster to open was Shredder, the tallest and longest free-spinning coaster in the world. This was a good fun ride, and felt quite long with a decent ride time. It wasn't particularly aggressive, didn't have much in the way of high speed, airtime, big drops or crazy spinning, but it made for a decent family sort of coaster, and shouldn't be too intimidating to anyone. Amongst other spinning coasters, I'd actually rate this quite highly. It's got a varied layout with some almost wild mouse style bits. There's a couple of small airtime hills near the end too, which give a little bit of floater air and add to the variety of the ride. One criticism I have for this coaster though, is the lift hill makes an absolute racket. echoes throughout the park, drowning out any of the music that's playing, or anyone trying to record a vlog on the site. The coaster is actually wrapped around the other major coaster at the park, Shell Razor, and I can imagine it would find some pretty interesting dueling sections when both coasters are running. Unfortunately, Shell Razor stayed closed for the whole day, and was probably the biggest spite of this American trip. I knew it had been open to the public on previous days, but for some reason I didn't even see it testing during my visit. I did see some workmen at the base of the chain lift at the start of the day, but after that there wasn't really any sign of activity at all. The ride is actually a near clone of Takabisha, a coaster I rode earlier this year in Japan, with a slight modification to make it half a degree steeper and capture the record as the world's steepest coaster. Personally, I think the record for steepest coaster is a bit dumb. It made sense up to when dive coasters started having 90 degree vertical drops, but when coaster drops started going beyond vertical, the marginal increases in steepness just got rather silly. Besides, if you're going to count beyond vertical drops as steeper than vertical, surely the steepest coaster would be screaming squiddle type coasters, such as this one at Gardaland, as the first drop would have to be measured at nearly 270 degrees. Anyway, this new coaster supposedly has the record at 121.5 degrees. Apart from the drop, just like Takabisha, it actually has quite a fun layout, with a launch section and no less than 7 inversions. I really enjoyed riding the version in Japan, and it was quite disappointing that the top attraction at this park stayed shut all day. Another coaster that remained closed but was testing was Timmy's Halfpipe Havoc, an Intamin Surf Rider Halfpipe coaster. I had little hope that this would open later, as although it was testing, the seats were only partially assembled, and it didn't even have test dummies on board. Interestingly, this halfpipe coaster did seem to have more modern seats with lap bars, rather than the over-the-shoulder restraints that are on similar coasters that I've ridden. Speaking of restraints, the ones on the only other operating coaster when I visited were really quite small, but fortunately I was able to squeeze into it. This one's called Nickelodeon Slime Streak, and is a chance custom family coaster. As family coasters go, it's not bad, it's got a decent drop, some mild airtime, and keeps its pace really well. It's unlikely set pulses racing for anyone but the youngest of riders, but it makes decent use of the space available, meandering around the park in a large loop. The final coaster in the park is Sandy's Blasting Bronco. This coaster seemed to be the furthest away from completion, as the train was in several pieces, and they seemed to still be testing the ride clearance, with a frame stuck to one of the cars. To me, this coaster looks like Intamin's answer to Premier Skyrockets, or coasters like Gale Force at Castaway Cove. It appears to be a multi-launch, going forwards, backwards and forwards again, into a very compact layout. I wouldn't expect this to be amazing, but if it proves popular, I could easily see variations of this popping up in many other parks. Despite many of the coasters being down, nearly all the flat rides were up and running, the main exception being the drop tower, which is called Nickelodeon Skyline Scream, and will take the record as the tallest indoor drop tower. I did see this testing, but it remained filled with dummies rather than people for the whole day. The park actually has a decent selection of flat rides too. Starting on the family side, there's a Rugrats Reptar themed carousel, and a Spongebob Squarepants jellyfish style chair swing. There are a couple more unique flat rides though, namely Invader Zim's flip and spin of Doom. 
This really was quite a strange ride. You control a rotating seat attached to a drivable base that should, in theory, flip you when another car hits a highlighted section on the bottom of your vehicle. This didn't really seem to work though, as it just seemed like at random points everyone would flip, and the collision seemed to do very little. Atom Smasher is another ride type I hadn't ridden before, which seems to be more of a modern version of the Looper Flat Ride at Knobles. Unlike the other version, you have a joystick to control your rotation, so you can go head over heels as much as you like. Thankfully, the ride cycle isn't too long, as the novelty of doing this quickly wears off. There's also an air race ride called Ang's Air Gliders. Now I'm not a huge fan of air races, as I find the motion not that fun, and the forces generally aren't very pleasant. I rode this version once, and it didn't really change my opinion of them. Likewise, there's an inverting frisbee ride that I decided to skip, as these sort of rides just aren't my cup of tea. Another supposedly record-breaking attraction they have here is their ropes course, which spans 10 stories. This is a good variety of challenging obstacles to cross, but if you're scared of heights, this is probably one to skip. If you're not acrophobic, however, this is well worth doing, mainly for the nice view you get from the top out over Manhattan. If you're not from the area, this is a very impressive view, but if you see it day to day, it's probably less special. Unfortunately, when I went, the top levels of the course were actually closed off for some unexplained reason, and whilst it looked like there were some abseiling sections you could have gone down, none of these were in operation either, adding to the generally unfinished feeling this park has. Another thing I think is worth mentioning about this park is the price. When I went, it was about $50 to get in, but this price is set to increase to nearly $80, on top of that when I went, the parking was free, but this is also set to increase to $24 per day. I do think they may be pricing themselves a bit high, as this isn't really a very big park, and for less than the price of a day's visit here, you get a Six Flags season pass and visit any one of their parks for as many times as you want for a whole year. Considering you've got the fantastic Six Flags Great Adventure and Six Flags New England within easy driving distance of this park, not to mention more competition from Hershey Park, Knobles or Dorney Park, as well as several others, it seems like this is quite a bad deal. Maybe they'll flood the market with two-for-one vouchers or something similar, as the current price just doesn't seem good value at all, and I think will put many people off. Another disappointing thing about this park was that there was no hot food in it at all, only some overpriced sandwiches and wraps. There are a couple of bars within a short drive of the park though, and I ended up having quite a nice lunch at a place called Red's. Overall, the park just has an unfinished feel to it. There were cables and other detritus scattered in various sections underneath the rides, and with only two of the five coasters operating during my visit, it really was quite disappointing. The park just didn't seem to be ready for the public yet, and they probably should have delayed opening until it was. Even the completed sections of the park didn't feel that well themed, and felt a bit sterile. Maybe have been spoiled by some of the amazing indoor parks of Dubai and Abu Dhabi, but this one just seemed to be lacking in so many areas. I'll probably return to this park once more on my next trip to the US, to experience the coasters that were closed when I went, but after that, I probably won't be coming back, as with limited space for expansion, I can't imagine them getting any new coasters or rides for the foreseeable future, and I'd rather put the price of entry towards another trip to Japan to ride the original Takabisha instead. Thanks so much for watching this video. If you've enjoyed it, be sure to subscribe for more content from other parks around the world. I've been Rollercoaster David, and I'll see you again in another video very soon.